it causes me to tremble. 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 Good evening and happy Good Friday to everyone. I want to just welcome you to our service this evening. I am Marquise Lockhart, the family pastor here at CCLW. And uh, before we kind of continue with our service, just wanted to make you aware of our service times for Easter uh, this coming Sunday. As you can see up on the screens, we've got three services on Easter, the first of which is our sunrise service at 7 a.m., and then our church services at 9 and 11. And so we invite you and your families, your neighbors, anybody who would like to join you and join us on that day to come and share in that celebration, that celebratory time with us. But tonight is a little bit different from Easter, right? Tonight is more of a solemn reflection in that before that celebratory victorious day where Jesus came back and rises from the grave there were some events that led up to that and this evening we get to take some time to reflect on the indescribable the amazing outpouring of the love of Jesus that was his death on the cross and so as a way to help us do that I'd like us to take a moment to read and listen to part of the scripture account taken from the book of John and this is in John 19 and this is what it says so the soldiers took charge of Jesus carrying his own cross he went out to the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha there they crucified him and with him two others one on each side and Jesus in the middle Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one, of, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened by, that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, but the sponge put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, 
Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the third day, it was the day of preparation, excuse me, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. We read this, and it is sometimes hard to imagine what it must have been like to see these things up close and personal. But when we think about it and we imagine it, we recognize that there were many who saw these events take place. There were people near the cross, at the foot of the cross. Many people who believed, many who did not believe. But there were people whose lives were changed by that day. One person in particular saw that face to face, but they had also witnessed his ministry for the three years prior, up close and personal. Her life was impacted by the life, the ministry, the work of Jesus, just as our lives have been impacted by that same ministry, but even more than that, that sacrifice. And so tonight, for just a few more moments, we'd like to spotlight that individual, share her story with you, and allow us to peer into her recollection of Jesus and his immeasurable love that has met us where we are and changed her very life. So we will now take time to listen to her story. My name is Mary Magdalene. I was named for my grandma Mary. She was honest, dependable, faithful, and true. Everything that I was not. I grew up in the small town of Magdalene, not far from Cana. And as I grew to be a woman, I got a lot of attention from men. And as time went on, I wanted to get closer to men, so I sold myself. This led to terrible feelings. I'm sure you understand. You probably sold yourself for something small, a job promotion, a salary increase, attention. Maybe you sold your best friend's secret just to be popular. You know this does not last. When you sell yourself for something so small, you feel worthless, like the world is crushing in on you. I became known in the area as someone very common. When your value goes down, it's hard to get back up. People see you that way. I just went from place to place, no real place to belong. Many of you understand, you feel that you don't belong anywhere either. But in the midst of all these men came someone quite different. I was in a crowd in the city of Nazareth. And as I walked by, people laughed. 
But then I literally ran into Jesus. I wasn't looking where I was going, and we bumped into each other. <laughs> Get away, someone said. I was pushed hard down into the dirt. I was angered. But then Jesus came over, and he reached his hand down to me, and he pulled me up, and he began to dust off my clothes. Are you all right? My name is Jesus. I thought he wanted me, so I said, two denarii. He said, no, I don't want to use you. I, I want to know your name. Well, this frightened me. It was very unusual for a woman to be asked her name, especially me. Mary? Mary, that is a beautiful name. That is my mother's name. Well, this was too much. I cried and I began to run away. But he called out, Mary, stop. You are special. I stopped and I looked at him. His eyes looked through me. It is said that he called seven demons out of me that day. The demons? Anger, guilt, fear, rejection, loneliness, deceit, and shame. When he called my name, my life changed. I began to follow Jesus. Jesus had new ideas different from anything I had ever heard. He said, we are salt and light. Somehow it was as if he was holding a mirror and I could see myself and what I could become. He said he came to call the sinners. Surely this meant me. Things felt so natural with this new sense of love. I was his friend. We talked often. But then, everything changed. Jesus took his disciples to an upper room for supper. He spoke of being betrayed, and then Judas left. And then he got a bowl and a towel, and he began to wash people's feet, and he told us to wash each other's feet. It was a humbling experience. One feels so unworthy. And then he took a few of the disciples into a garden, and the next thing we heard, he had been hauled off for trial. From then on, it was terrible. We heard people cry, crucify him. Why do they hate him? Why did they want to kill him? Jesus loved everybody. Men in the crowd who I had known came up to me, and I pushed them away, and I said, I am Mary Magdalene. I am a new person. Jesus died hanging on a cross. I got as close to him as I could. I leaned on the cross crying, his blood running down my splintered fingers. He came for those of us on the outside of life. He gave us a home, a place to fit in. Others fled, but I stayed by the cross. I heard a centurion say, surely this is the son of God. He recognized it. Jesus embraced the world with a love that takes all fear away. Like a rose trampled on the ground, he took the fall and thought of me. I don't know what demons bother you, 
but he can change you. His love is more powerful than death. It changed me. If you just listen, Jesus is calling your name. He can change your life too. Above all 
Loving God, for our sake, our Redeemer suffered death and was buried and rose again. With heartfelt love, let us adore him and, and pray, Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, our teacher, for our sake, you were obedient even to accepting death. Teach us to obey the Father's will in all things. Christ, our life, by your death on the cross, you destroyed the power of evil and death. May we die with you to rise with you in glory. Christ, our King, you became an outcast among us, a man scorned and mocked by crowds, both of enemies and friends. Teach us the humility <clears throat> by which you saved the world. Christ, our salvation, you gave yourself up to death out of love for us. Help us to show your love to one another. Christ, our Savior, on the cross you embraced all time with your outstretched arms. Unite God's scattered children in your kingdom of salvation. Lord, your Son has suffered so much, shed so much blood, all for us and our salvation. We were born with so many faults in a state of sin, and our nature is so full of weaknesses. And yet your Son has died on the cross for our sins, for the sins of the world, for us, for me. We know your grace has the power to cleanse us of our many sins and to make us more like your Son, to make us whole. Thank you for your goodness and love for us. We ask, O oh Father, that you watch over us always. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray this way, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good evening. My name is Ryan. I serve as senior pastor here at CCLW. I'm thankful for the chance to be together this evening. Uh, anybody joining us online as well, thankful that you can worship with us uh, wherever you happen to be. Why should we call it Good Friday? It's a little strange. Um, it's all about Jesus' suffering. It doesn't seem very good. Um, Jesus' followers certainly didn't feel like it was good on that day. I mean, they thought, you know, is this whole thing over? You know, we've been with Jesus for three years, and he's said all these incredible things and done all these incredible things, and is it over? The reason we call it Good Friday um, in English, when you're thinking just in terms of uh, our language, if you rewind a number of centuries back to kind of the Middle Ages, the word good had a um, spiritual connotation to it. Uh, so it, it kind of meant sacred or holy. And so Good Friday literally meant Holy Friday. Um, and it is a holy day. I mean, this is a, 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 a sacred day, a set-apart day, a somber day, a day that changed history and really altered the trajectory of human history, the spiritual trajectory of every person who's ever known the Lord. Now, the first clear glimpse, very clear glimpse, that Jesus would suffer came seven centuries before Jesus' life um, because God gave the prophet Isaiah a glimpse of what the Messiah would do and what the Messiah would be like. And Isaiah, you know, he lived in a time of uncertainty. There was a lot of hopelessness. A lot of the people of Israel had turned their back on God. They were facing threats from larger military powers in the vicinity. And so a lot of God's people, the Israelites, were wondering if God even still loves them, is, is even still present in their life. Like, is he ever going to rescue us? And in that time, God allows Isaiah to look seven centuries into the future and just have a glimpse of his ultimate rescue plan. And Isaiah got to see a glimpse of the Messiah, and the Messiah that he saw was not a conquering hero, but a suffering servant. And so we can find this in Isaiah 53, and I will say, of all the passages in the Old Testament that you might memorize, or at least memorize the reference to, remember Isaiah 53. It's an incredibly important chapter. Again, this was written seven centuries before Jesus' life. And it's describing who the Messiah would be. Look what it says in Isaiah 53. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. It's talking about Jesus here. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. So, it's saying that the Messiah is not going to be a renowned figure. That would be surprising to the Israelites who assumed the Messiah would be a renowned figure. Verse 4, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. In other words, people would misunderstand and think that because the Messiah was suffering, he, was, he had done something wrong or was being you know, afflicted by God because of his own sin or something. So people would misunderstand what was going on when the Messiah died and suffered. Verse 5, but, here's the real story, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So in other words, the Messiah is going to get the punishment we deserve. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life. And be satisfied. So here's a glimpse of the resurrection. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I, this is God speaking, the Father, will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. 
Isn't it incredible that that was written seven centuries before the life of Jesus? Isaiah had this vision of restoration through a servant, someone who would suffer for the salvation of others. But when we read this about Jesus' suffering in the gospel accounts like we read earlier and then here in Isaiah, when we read about Jesus' suffering and dying for our sins, it does beg the question, why did Jesus have to die? I mean, couldn't God just forgive? But to ask, couldn't God just forgive, is to undervalue relationship damage and what real forgiveness requires. Um, Tim Keller, in his classic book, The Reason for God, talks about this, about two elements of forgiveness that are really important. I want to put these on the screen. The first is this, is that true forgiveness requires suffering. True forgiveness requires suffering. And we actually already know this. Because when we are wronged, we feel it deep down, perhaps for years. I mean, some of you can remember right now, with crystal clarity, something someone did to you that was wrong when you were a child. Or 10 years ago, or last month, whatever it is. Harm has a gravity to it. It cannot be ignored. Um, it, there's a tangible debt that has to be paid. It's got to be made right. Someone has to pay the debt of the wrong. And so when we are in a situation of having been wronged, we have two choices, right? We can make someone else, make that person pay by withholding forgiveness, staying angry, trying to exact revenge of some kind, which then, of course, becomes corrosive to us. That's one choice. The other choice is that we pay the cost ourselves by not seeking revenge, not trying to get even, and trying to move on and forgive. And listen, that hurts. I mean, you've ever, ever experienced that? The pain of forgiving? Forgiving, though right, rarely feels right, at least at the beginning. Because listen, what forgiveness is, is you paying the price for an injury done to you instead of making the offender pay. And so we feel that cost when we pay it. And, and we are made in God's image. So if we feel that way when we're forgiving that there's this great cost, I mean, magnify that infinitely to how God feels when we have offended him, sinned against him. Our, our emotions are just little human-sized echoes of how he feels. And our desire for justice when we've been wronged is, is multiplied much more greatly in him. I mean, the sins of humanity, the untold trillions of offenses against God, it was in accumulating this hopeless relational debt that we could never pay back to make things right. So God had two choices to restore our relationship, right? Make us pay the debt of our wrongs, which was impossible. We could never do that. Or he could pay the cost and take on the debt himself. True forgiveness requires that, it requires suffering. The other aspect of forgiveness is this, that love, real love always involves sacrifice, a sacrificial exchange. Real life-changing love is, is self-giving. It involves sacrificing for somebody else. I mean, anyone who's a parent understands this, um, that, that, you know, in, in loving someone who is in need, I mean, you know, you're, you're exchanging your preferences, your rest, your, your comfort for the good of somebody else. And it's not just in parenting, and it's in so many elements of life. Real, true love is always self-sacrificing. And so we're beginning to see that there's no such thing as just forgiving. To forgive is to suffer. To forgive is to make a sacrifice. And the gravity of our sins against God required payment beyond anything we could ever offer in our own strength. And so if we ask, you know, why couldn't Jesus just forgive? Or why did Jesus have to die? It actually reveals we haven't really grasped the darkness and depth of our own sin and our offenses against God and our need to be rescued and to be forgiven. And as Paul put it, all of us have sinned and fallen far short of God's glory. Now, in the Old Testament period, there was a way to deal with sin, um, and it involved a price being paid, and it involved a sacrifice. Because again, that's what forgiveness is. There is a sacrifice there, and a price is paid. 
And the way it was done in the Old Testament was a lamb, an actual sacrifice was made. If somebody sinned, they would bring an innocent lamb as a substitute to the priest. And the priest, as an intermediary in ancient Israel, would receive that sacrifice at the temple. And then, by the way, the priests uh, weren't perfect either. So they had to do sacrifices for their own sins. And the problem is that over generations, these millions of offerings, it didn't change anybody's hearts. And in Isaiah, God basically says to Israel, I am sick of all these sacrifices. They're doing nothing. The sin debt was piled too high. The alienation between creator and, and created was too, it was too far, that chasm. And so God's people were just treading water, gasping for breath. And in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, we, we discover why Jesus needed to die and how he was the perfect, permanent, sacrificial solution to all of our sin and alienation from God. In Hebrews 7, it's talking about the priests, remember, who would get the lamb and they'd sacrifice the lamb for somebody's sin. Listen to this, Hebrews 7. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But Jesus, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. It's a powerful passage. This is really the point that this passage is making. I'll put it up here on the screen. Is that Jesus was the perfect sacrificer and the perfect sacrifice. Just like you imagine there was the, the priest in Israel and then there was the lamb. Jesus was the perfect priest and the lamb. He was the sacrifice and the one offering the sacrifice. We don't have to go through an intermediary to be reconciled to God. We have direct access to God because of Christ. And we don't have to bring a sacrifice, prove ourselves to God, and do this over and over in perpetuity. Jesus brought the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. He offered the sacrifice. Once and for all, it is finished. This is why Jesus had to die. There was no other way to fully, finally forgive us, to satisfy that debt of sin, the relational damage that's done when there's a break and to bridge that chasm between God and humanity. Jesus had to do this. So what does this mean because he did this? We, we continue reading in Hebrews, this is chapter 10. The writer says this, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, here it is, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Jesus is faithful. And he invites us to draw near. And his sacrifice, his exchange reconciled us to him. He had to sacrifice himself. He was willing to, and the best part is he wanted to. He demonstrates his unimaginable love for us. So let us draw near to God. The door is open. Jesus is faithful. And he proved his faithfulness not only in the fact that he died, but in the way that he died. And uh, just as I begin to wrap up here, I want to just lastly consider with you the darkest moment of Good Friday um, when Jesus was on the cross crying out to his Father. Um, this is recorded in the Gospels. Here's the version from Matthew 27. It says this, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. And this is Aramaic, the language he spoke. Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he's on the cross and he's crying out to God saying, why, why is this happening? Where are you? 
How could you do this? And, you know, Jesus has been so in control, it, it, silent, quiet even, before, even during his trial, he, you know, he didn't speak out in his own defense. Now he's shouting from the cross, and he's not talking about this hurts, or, which obviously it did, but he, he's, it's a relational cry, right? Where are you, Father? Why are you letting this happen? And so we have to think beyond physical suffering here. This is spiritual suffering. He, he's, he's, he's experiencing distance. He's been removed from the warmth and the light of his relationship with his Father. In effect, this is hell. Hell is separation from God. And this is what Jesus is going through right now on the cross. In effect, that's hell. He's screaming out because he's experiencing that for every person who's ever lived or will live all at once. And no one has ever been closer to the Father than him. Intimately connected to his Father for eternity toward the past. And he's experiencing this break and he's crying out, but there's, there's hope in this scream because he's not just shouting random words. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And um, these are the opening lines of Psalm 22, written a thousand years before Jesus' life. And that Psalm pointed forward to the Messiah who would suffer and be vindicated by the Lord. And so when Jesus shouts those opening lines of Psalm 22, He's, he's, anyone listening, he's sort of calling to mind to them the whole of that psalm. And it was a very popular psalm, so anybody around the cross, when he cries out those words, they know he's referring to Psalm 22, and the whole of that psalm comes into their mind, and I want you to look at how that psalm ends. It starts with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want you to look at the end. Verse 23, this is just a selection from the end of the psalm. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. That's Jesus. God has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. He has done it starts with, why have you forsaken me? And it ends with, he has done it. And so Jesus, in the midst of essentially hell for all of us, shouts out the words of that psalm, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at first glance, that can seem like it's a defeat and it's bleak, but it's actually a declaration of victory. And Jesus was using that scripture to signal that despite the misery of the moment, He's still going forward with this. He'll take the infinite suffering for you and for me. He's done it. And so on Sunday, we will celebrate that moment, the victory. But tonight, we remember the physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, relational anguish that Jesus endured. Why was he willing to? In the words of Paul, to rescue us from the dominion of darkness and bring us into his kingdom. That is why we call it Good Friday. So we're gonna end now, we're gonna end the service and what we're gonna do is um, we're just gonna play some, some quiet music in here, some reflective music and we just wanna invite you and you can do this if you're watching online at home. We wanna invite you to just take a few minutes here in prayer. You can come up to the front if you'd like, you can stay in the pew, you can just wherever you are comfortable and just take a few minutes in reverent prayer and reflection on what Jesus did on the cross. And uh, when you're ready to leave, we encourage you to just uh, leave in, in quiet reflection. And then we'll see you Sunday.